Hello, this is David Scher. I'm back for another lecture in Physics 572, Introduction to Health Physics. And uh, last time we spoke about the basic interactions photons undergo with matter. Talked about photoelectric effect, Compton effect, pair production. Uh, and today we're going to go over a little bit more of that material and uh, start the slides now so we can begin. Um, last time we talked a little bit about uh, cross-section. I said it was uh, related to the uh, probability of an interaction and I want to explain that a little bit more. Um, so if we think about two different disks and we have some photons incident on those two disks, it's pretty clear the disk two would have more interactions than disk one. It's just bigger, so it'll catch more of the photons. Okay, um, so uh, the, what would what would be the difference? Well, the the number of photons that are going to be captured is going to be proportional to the surface area of each of these disks, and so that's where the concept of cross section comes in. If these were spheres instead of disks. It would be the cross-sectional area, not necessarily the whole surface area that would be involved. Okay, so we carry this over uh, to atomic and nuclear physics. The notion that if there are some interactions with some entity, the the probability that there will be an interaction is related to, that's intrinsic to the scatterer. We call the cross section, um, and the units of the cross section are uh, square centimeter. And later on, we'll talk about some specialized units called barns that are a little bit different, but we'll get to there. Um, but the important point here is you can see intuitively the, the cross-sectional area of, of the target, of the scattering object, uh, will affect the number of interactions. Let's think now about the beam coming in. So we have two situations here, one with a, a large number, a small number of photons, and on the bottom, a larger number of photons. It's pretty clear that there would be more interactions in the bottom scenario than in the top scenario. And so what would determine how many interactions takes place? Well, it's the density of these per unit area. The more photons per square centimeter that are incident on the target, the more interactions there would be. So we give this, this quantity the name fluence. It's the number of particles, or in this case photons, per unit area. That's how many that would affect how many interactions took place. Sometimes we're interested in rates. So the flux is the fluence rate, or it's the number of particles per square centimeter per second. So that's the concept of flux. Um, the number density is another thing. So if I have more than one scatterer, the more scatterers I have, the more interactions will take place. And so the number of the, these different scatterers. Uh, per unit volume affects the, the number of interactions. So the number density is the number of targets per square per cubic centimeter of the object. That will affect how many total um, interactions take place. Now, let's talk about the concept of attenuation. Um, each interaction that takes place removes a photon from the beam. And so uh, we attenuate the number of the intensity of the beam, the number, the, the fluence uh, is attenuated by the scattering process. For each small distance that's traveled, dx, infinitesimal distance, phi changes by an amount d phi. A certain number of the photons are removed. d phi is, well, let's think about the things we just talked about. The, the more the bigger phi is, the more interactions will occur. The bigger the number density is, the more interactions will occur. And the bigger the sigma is, the more interactions will occur. In addition, how far we travel uh, in the material would uh, affect how many um, occur. So uh, d sigma is, is, we just multiply all these together and we, we find out what the change in, in phi would be. Um, it's convenient to give phi n, this combination of constants, a new name. 
and we call it the linear attenuation coefficient. We frequently use the symbol mu to represent that. Now, what are the units? Well, the units of sigma are square centimeter, and the number density is a number per cubic centimeter, or per centimeter to the minus three. So the units of mu of the linear attenuation coefficient is per centimeter. So let's go back to our equation. Now we have the change in phi is equal to minus. It's minus because we're decreasing phi. So it's minus mu times phi times dx. If we solve this equation, it tells us that phi at some depth x is equal to the initial phi times e to the minus mu x. It says there's a, an exponential attenuation as we go through matter. Okay, now let, let's move on to the next concept, and that is the mass attenuation coefficient. So sometimes it's useful to um, uh, uh, change the way we address uh, uh, the, that density. The density does make a difference in terms of the number of scatterers, but it's it's convenient sometimes to, to uh, take it out of the equation, to uh, instead of including it in our linear attenuation coefficient, to move it over to the, the distance. So um, we talk, convenient to divide by the mass density, and we'll talk about why in a minute. So um, if uh, rho is the mass density, it's related to the number density in this way. So the number density is how many atoms per cubic centimeter, and then how much does each atom weigh? Well, the mass number A has Avogadro number. So there are um, Avogadro's number in A grams of material. So uh, if we take the number per cubic centimeter times the mass per atom, A over N zero, Avogadro's number, that's 6.02 times out of the 23rd. So um, then that's what that would give us the, the grams per cubic centimeter. So the mass attenuation coefficient is mu divided by this physical mass density. So the mu had units of one over a centimeter, rho is grams per cubic centimeter. If we divide all that out, we get square centimeter per gram as the units of the mass attenuation coefficient. Why is it convenient to do this? Well, um, Suppose we have some atom that's in, in many different states. Uh, sometimes it's a gas, sometimes it's in, in a uh, solid, etc. Then the density will change this mu, uh, the, the mu quite a lot. There will be less per uh, uh, centimeter that's removed from a low density material uh, and more per centimeter. So if we use mu over rho, if we take it out of the equation, then the number we use in this coefficient is more consistent. Um, you remember these, uh, the graph we talked about last time, it had this attenuation co coefficient mu over rho. Uh, but when we do use this mu over rho, we have to change the x in our equ equation. We had phi is equal to phi zero e to the minus mu x. Well, if I'm I divide by rho, I have to multiply back by rho. So I divide by rho and multiply back by rho. So our depth is measured in units of aerial density, physical density times the depth traveled. Uh, so uh, under this condition, then the, the photons that are removed are the, the, the photon we have left, phi, is the original amount e to the minus mu over rho times rho x. Okay, so that's uh, the mass, how we use the mass attenuation coefficient. And uh, next concept I want to pass along is a linear energy transfer coefficient, or yeah, the linear and the mass energy transfer coefficient. Um, sometimes it's, it's important that we know how much energy is transferred to the medium. This is about, the mu is about how many photons are removed from the beam. It's not about, you know, and the photons can be removed either by absorption or by scattering or a combination of them. Uh, but it's just the, the, some of the, the photons will be uh, undergo compton scattering off at some angle, they're still removed from the beam. 
Sometimes we're interested in how much energy is transferred to the electrons. Um, and uh, so when a photon interacts with, with matter, not all the energy is transferred. For example, in Compton scattering, unless there's a secondary photon that goes on that carries away, can be quite a bit of the energy, can be up to um, uh, almost all the energy can continue on with a very slight scatter. Uh, and certainly, even when there's a head-on collision, some of the energy is going to be uh, retained by the scattered photon. Never have all the energy transferred to the electron in the Compton effect. So um, the energy transfer coefficient takes account for this. It's the uh, amount of energy that's transferred. We reduce the, the interactions by the amount of energy that passes on as a scattered photon, as a secondary photon. Uh, so mu tr, energy transfer coefficient, accounts for this loss. And there's, there's a linear form of it, mu tr, and then there's a mass form of it, mu tr over r, just like there was for the uh, attenuation coefficient. Now, so after the, energy, the photon energy is transferred to the electron, we account for the amount that's, that's lost through, through the scattering. The electrons can also undergo bremsstrahlung. We talked about that before. And so some of the energy that's transferred to the electron might be lost again later on in a subsequent bremsstrahlung interaction. So the energy absorption coefficient takes account for this loss the, through uh, the radiative radiat process through uh, bremsstrahlung. So the energy absorption coefficient has the symbol mu e n and the mass energy absorption coefficient, mu en over rho, account for the loss due to Bremsstrahlung. Uh, I, yeah, so we'll talk about these electron processes in a future lecture. So we've talked about uh, the concepts of the attenuation coefficient, energy transfer coefficient. Um, where can we get data about them so we can use them to do problems? Well, one reliable source is on the NIST website. I think we talked about NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. It's a very um, reliable source for information. And here's a link that leads to their website. They have data tables and graphs for elements and many compounds and mixtures that give, give us attenuation data. Here is the website. If you go to that address that I just showed you, this is what the web page will look like. It talks about the mass attenuation coefficients. That's the form it presents them in. So if we scroll down on the page, and you hear abstracts, and as we're abstract, we see a bunch of links down here. Um, this is about the X-ray or photon mass attenuation coefficient. Uh, this link gives us a description of all the things I've explained to you so far. Um, table 1 gives the material properties for elements. Table 2 gives the properties for compounds. What's the composition of tissue? What's the, what's the chemical form for the materials that they have? Uh, table 3, which is where the real information is, shows us the uh, data for elemental media, for, for pure atoms, a, a pure element. Table 4 gives us compounds. So this, if we click on Table 3 and, and we look at elemental data, then it gives us a whole bunch of elements to choose from, all these uh, elements in the periodic table. If we uh, so the, the second table four compounds, these are the compounds that are available. It's some different materials that are useful. Uh, many of these are very, very useful for, for different purposes. Uh, tissue for measuring. Um, uh, it's going to be for assessing dose to tissue, um, uh, lead glass, lithium fluoride, all kinds of different materials that are useful. Now, if we click on elements and we choose aluminum, first thing we'll see on that page is uh, a graph showing mu over rho and mu en over rho. And so it shows us uh, what the values of these the attenuation coefficient and the energy absorption coefficient are. Um, notice the difference here. One thing that's interesting to notice about mu en, it's fairly constant over a wide range of energies. Mu 
the attenuation coefficient isn't usually always that constant as much as the energy absorption coefficient. It's because the uh, a Compton scattering that uh, accounts for the difference between them is uh, important uh, or gives off uh, about the same amount of energy. Or it, it, anyway, the interaction is such that the energy absorption is the same over a broad range or very close to the same. Below that on the page we look at, we would find a table with datas with data. This is for aluminum that we have here. It's uh, notice that the, there, there are two tables that are shown. One is in ASCII format and another is HTML. The ASCII is handy for a reason I'll show you in a minute. But um, it, uh, many different points on the graph and what the value of the two curves are. Uh, they both have the same data, they're just different formats. The energy that's provided is in MeV, so 10 to the minus 3 is 1 electron volt. 10 to the minus 2 is 10, uh, excuse me, kilovolt. Kilovolt uh, is 10 to the minus 3. 10 to the minus 2 is 10 uh, keV, uh, etc. Uh, now the absorptions are given in, in square centimeters per gram. Uh, so I'm going to fix that. I got that wrong. But um, And the uh, notations, they give, they give the... Uh, the uh, value of mu en at regular intervals, and also add in the discontinuities that are due to the absorption edges, so that you can reconstruct this graph based on the tables here. Um, now, the two, uh, what I did in this case is I highlighted this table with my uh, mouse, and then I uh, copied Control C, and then I clicked in Excel on this table. Uh, the, the top right cell, top left cell, and then click paste, control V. And this table is reproduced into Excel, so that I would have access to this table for uh, doing cal calculations in Excel later on. So this is an easy way to transfer the data uh, to Excel. Okay. Um, now, let's talk about the mass absorption uh, coefficient and, and radiation dose. So the absorbed dose is the amount of energy that's absorbed per unit mass in an object. The units are uh, joules per kilogram. Joule is a unit of energy. Per kilogram is a unit of mass. This has a special name of gray. It's a gray. So let's think about what, what's going on here. The number of, uh, number of photons uh, per square centimeter each carry uh, e uh, fraction of that energy that's absorbed, and rho is the, the mass density. So this is per square centimeter, uh, and this becomes per cubic centimeter. This is kilograms per cubic centimeter or per, per unit uh, volume. The per, the volume the per uh, per uh, cubic centimeter cancels out, and we end up with the the energy per unit mass. What's going on here is we have photons that are incident, and then they um, impart energy to uh, electrons. The electrons uh, spread out their energy th throughout the medium through the electrical force, the Coulomb interactions. Uh, some of the energy escapes, that's Compton scattering, uh, and that so we use mu en because it accounts for that Compton scattering. And some of the, uh, the electrons lose energy from Bremsstrahlen. And so that's also uh, removed from the mu en. So it's the amount of energy that's imparted to electrons that stays in the electrons per unit mass. Okay. Um, let's talk about attenuation now, another concept, the uh, application of these things. So the dose is proportional to phi, as we saw here. The dose, uh, joules per kilogram, is proportional to the incident fluence. So we had this equation that phi is equal to phi is zero e to the minus mu x. Well, it's also true that for dose is equal to the h is the dose at any depth is equal to the initial dose e times e to the minus mu x. So let's look at an example. Let's say we have a source that's emitting one half MeV photons and at a dose rate of 10 milligray per hour. What happens if we put one centimeter of lead in, in, into that, I mean, also in that source? What will the new do, uh, dose rate be? 
So first we need to do is we need to go get our attenuation data. On that graph we had before, the first column was the attenuation coefficient, the second column, well first column is the energy, then you have the attenuation coefficient, then the energy absorption coefficient. So um, at a half of an MeV, 0.5 MeV is what we have here, then the mu over rho is 0.614 uh, square centimeter per gram. Okay, um, 0.1614, the e to the minus 1 means move the decimal point over 1. Okay, the density is 11, of lead is 11.35, so we take the, the mu is equal to the uh, 0.1614 square centimeter per gram times the 11.35 grams per cubic centimeter, and we end up with 0.832 uh, per, square, per centimeter is the attenuation coefficient. This should be a mu and not an m. I'll need to fix that. Um, so we put this into our equation. h is equal to h0 e to the minus mu x. The initial uh, dose rate, it was 10 milligray per hour. e to the minus mu is 1.832 times 1 centimeter. It's, if we put that in our calculator, it turns out that the expo exponential is equal to 0.16 uh, 01, so the dose rate is reduced to 1.6 milligray from 10. Okay, um, that's an example of how we use this information and these coefficients that we've developed. And I will correct those typos before I uh, post the slides. Um, let's talk a little bit about radiation detection so we can use our information that we learned about photon interactions. It has applicability to a radiation detection. Just as we learned for dose, we, we uh, import, it's important here that photons are indirectly ionizing. Um, what happens is the photon interacts with the electron, and then the electron is what causes more energy, all the energy to be absorbed. Um, so when we have a radiation detector, the instruments actually uh, detect the uh, energy that's transferred to the electrons. Uh, and that's what we're actually seeing with our uh, spectro spectrometer. So um, the things we learned about uh, uh, our different uh, uh, photon interactions are, are important when we look at uh, an instrument that's doing uh, radiation spectroscopy. So we're going to do an example looking at cobalt-60. The important point for here is cobalt-60 has two gamma rays. One at 1.7 MeV and 1.33 MeV. So if we look at a detector, we would find that there are two peaks. After we as we count it, we would see two peaks. For those two photon peaks, these represent the photoelectric effect. So the electron is absorbing all of the gamma ray energy. It's being ejected from. Um, elements, the, the atoms that are in the, the detector, and carrying away all the energy, and so that's the signal we get, is when all the energy is carried away. And we have all this other information, all this other structure. Well, what is that? This is all due to the Compton effect. So the Compton effect can have many different values. Of it, it can have a, a, a large amount of energy right here. If there's a head-on collision, if there's a glancing blow, almost no energy is transferred to the electron. Is a much lower energy. Um, so that's what this spectrum is. Um, this drop-off here is called the Compton edge, and that occurs, that's the highest energy of the Compton electrons. It occurs when there's a knock-on collision, when the photon scatters at 180 degrees from its original direction, scatters backward. If we go back and look at the Compton formula, you'll remember that uh, it's uh, the Electron, the, the energy that's imported to the um, electron is going to be equal to the photon energy times this 1 minus 1 over 1 plus, it was E gamma over mc squared times 1 minus a cosine. Well, it turns out that that's 2 uh, when we include a cosine of 180 degrees. And so this is the maximum energy that's imparted to an electron, and it represents the Compton edge. The rest of these are all Compton scattering uh, at a lower energy uh, to the
part of the electron. More of the energy is carried off by the photon. Okay, well that's what I have for you today. Uh, we had a, um, a homework assignment that you turned in yesterday. I'm anxious to look at those. I haven't had a chance to look at them yet. I'm going to hold off on a new assignment so I see what's, how, how this is working in terms of the other assignments. So we should have a new assignment shortly uh, uh, where we can um, demonstrate what we knew, rehearse this, this uh, information from uh, the photon interactions. I thank you for your attention. I hope you have a great weekend.